This is from um, a book called Anatomy for the Artist by Paul Rocher, and is, is the, the book that I recommend most highly of you know, any, it's like the classical text on, on anatomy. Paul Rocher was a 19th century, um, well, anatomy teacher, but he came from a medical background. So he kind of had that balance of, he was a doctor and then he was teaching artists, so he found that balance. And it's this kind of thing that, like if I'm going around a studio, I would expect at any given time to see however many ecochet models on desks or however many things on, on monitors that people are using this as a, as a reference point. And this is where I think like, th this is where I think you can get unstuck really quickly and where studying anatomy can, can really take you off on a tangent that you, that you don't want to go down. Because what happens with this, with this approach, you know, and the way that I learned it was I, I opened up this book and I copied every drawing out of the book and then I kind of went, and now probably I know anatomy. But it was the same trap that so many people fall into, which is what you do is you create uh, a world where you have all of your anatomy information there. And that lives kind of side by side with the real world. And you, you sort of look to find places that they touch. And because like, as soon as you take the skin off the body, it's such an alien and unusual thing that it, it's very difficult, I think, to actually connect those two things. And also, like, so something like this is an ex example that I, would, that I would always use of like, this could kill you, man, because this gives you no sense of what the priority should be. And so many times when I see people working with the back, and they're working diligently using something like that as reference, you end up with something like a flat plane with all of these muscles drawn into it, you know? And it's like, well, if, if you're thinking about what is actually happening there, you're thinking in terms of prioritizing the form, then you go, well, the most important form is gonna be the bone, because that's the thing that sets up your proportions, sets up your rhythm, sets up your gesture, all of that. And then it's gonna be the, the, um, the muscles that impact the form the most, which would be underneath these thin muscles, you know, peeling them off and seeing what's underneath there, which would be your lumbar, your serratus, your rhomboids. We'll, we'll talk about this in, in more depth, but basically, like, you'd, you'd be better off not even starting if, you know, if you end up just copying that. So, like, time and time again, you know, it happens to us all, like, something like that will take you off on a tangent. So, um, so my process when I'm working with an actor, when I'm thinking about it, when I'm teaching it, is to go, um, let me think about it from the point of view of story. Something, some, something like that, Rather, you know, because typically we would say, okay, well, to get around this problem, you would prioritize based off of form, right? Biggest forms, and then you go into your secondary forms, and then tertiary forms, and then, and then you put on the pause and stuff like that, and that seems like a sensible way of working, and of course it is. Um, but another way of thinking about it would be um, to prioritize based off of story. An example being, like, if I, if I bend my arm through here, and if we're talking about, you know, actual deformation, something like that, in, in a production workflow, well, the, the story of any bent joint is going to be bone because joints are, are, are generally bony. There's not much muscle over the joint. So as soon as I bend that, the loose skin that is there suddenly pops out. So in order to get that story convincing, I've just got to find the sharpness of the bone. If I, if I hit that, then really I'm hitting 90% of what I need. And if the opposite is happening, what's the story here? Well, I could look at it different ways. The triceps are the muscle that's straightening the arm. So maybe I want to think about the transition from the triceps to the triceps tendon. Or maybe like the skin here is loose, and in a lot of people you'll see that as a fold, right? So you'll see this little line through there. So suddenly this line, this tertiary detail, this little fold, that if we're thinking about form in terms of size, uh, would be the final thing that we go to, suddenly becomes super important, right? Suddenly you want to hit that to tell the story of the arm being straight. So I think this, you know, whether you agree with it or not, is certainly a, a useful thought exercise to, to take through and to just go, right, what is, what is the most important story here? What is it the thing that I'm trying to convey? And just stripping back the, the magic of it, taking, taking away this separate anatomy world where you can't quite connect it with the real world, just go, no, this is real world stuff. You know, uh, the, anything that we're depicting will probably be made of skin, fat, muscle, tendon, bone, cartilage. Uh, that, that's probably as much as we need to depict, right? And, and nails and hair and whatever, but less interested in that, in, in that for the time being. So what is the balance of those things? In what way are they manifesting on the surface now? And how do I depict those things? And just always taking things back to like the, the most basic components that we can and building from that. So what I, what I want to do is some uh, demonstrations to show you like how I'm thinking about form, how I'm approaching form. Um, and each one of those will have, each one of those demonstrations would have some sort of theme. Um, a lot of this stuff I know we'll be covering things that you guys know already because, uh, because you're professional, it's what you do. But, uh, but hopefully there's some things in terms of ways of thinking about stuff that, that might be useful. Um, 
uh, the, it's unlikely that we'll have any time for any like Q&A or anything like that at the end. Um, so I'm quite happy to take questions while I'm demonstrating. Depends, if we start falling behind time, if you can see me visibly sweating, then maybe I'll focus on just talking about the thing, but it will be nice like to, um, you know, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy to welcome questions because this, this format, this kind of lecture format, I talk to you and, and you listen, is not the most, um, it's not the best approach for learning anything, right? So, um, so the more that you can engage, any questions that you've got, I'm, I'm happy to take them. Um, so yeah, let's, well, let's just start with working through some stuff. So the first thing that I want to, we're going to take a look at a, a male torso, right? And then we'll, and then we'll deviate from there. Um, the theme of what I want to talk about here, I'm just going to start by blocking in the bones, is like an idea of the most important thing, right? At, at any given time, what is the most important thing that you need to be conveying, right? That relates to the, the storytelling idea, but also like if you, if you want to be able to, to construct hips very quickly or rib cage very quickly, you can kind of, you need to map it down to like, okay, what are the five things that are going to define that? And then, and then just aim on hitting those, you know? So, um, and, and bearing in mind that this whole time, we want to build up to complexity, but through simplicity, right? So everything that I want to do here wants to be, <coughs> wants to be super simple. So for example, we'll start with, uh, we'll start with a rib cage. So all I'm interested in the rib cage, really, let's say there's five things, and one of them, one of them is going to be just the fact that it's an egg shape. And that, that will get you like most of the way there, really. Like it'll get, get you most of what you need. And oftentimes when I'm when I'm teaching these forms, I just say with an egg, with the rib cage, just make it like a nice delicious egg, like you were going into the shops to buy an egg. And then I see students like doing that or whatever, and I'm like, it's, it's not so delicious. So the basis of that is really, it's just that, um, but on a human figure, we flatten it front to back. On a quadruped, we flatten it from side to side, right? Because they're gonna, they're gonna be moving forwards through that plane, so it needs to be more aerodynamic. Um, so one theme that we'll be talking about a lot today is like, just why? Just what is the, you know, every time when you're hitting, um, or you're learning anything about anatomy, just why is, why is that? You know, don't just, don't just accept anything that anyone says, don't accept anything that I say or that you read, just, when you figure it out, um, start, it starts to become a more, much more powerful tool that you can use. So here I've got my egg, um, and you know, I do have rules of course, like for the proportions, so I like, the rib cage would be one half heads high, one quarter heads wide, chop it in half, that gives you the bottom of the sternum, but that's not stuff, that, that's stuff that's really easy for you to find elsewhere, so I, I'm not really going to focus on that. I'm just going, what is the most important thing? Well, this, this uh, skeletal arch is going to be pretty important, and then I'll spin around to the back. And this plane of the back, right, where the ribs break to go in towards the spine. Very, very important. Like, I think, I think the back is uh, something that throws, a, throws us off a lot of the time, so I'll take a little bit of time to go into that. But it becomes very simple if you just prioritize the form correctly. So here, just finding that plane break of the back. And that, that's there for a reason, right? Because we would think of the spine of, as being like a, a bony structure of the back, but really the spine is trying to come through to the middle of these forms because that's the most sensible way to support the body. But right? if you want to find where the spine is in the head, it's just, or in the neck, it's, it's, you, cut the, you cut the head in half, the spine's halfway across, right? So it's, it's going right towards the middle to, to support it. So because of that, we have this plane break. The spine is buried within the rib cage, not hanging out the back. And then that is, is pretty much all that I would need. You know, there's a couple of other things, like I could, um, I could chop open the top there, that's going to be my, my opening. Um, I could find some... I can find some planes through here, because here at the front we have these planes where the ribs tend to cartilage, but honestly, like, the pectoralis muscle is covering that, the abdominals are, are covering that. This plane break, very noticeable if you look at a rib cage by itself, not so noticeable in life. So it's like, it's not even in my top, top five list of things that I'm looking for in the rib cage. So all I'm looking for is, Egg shape, flatten it front to back, find the plane break on the back, find that sternal opening, and, and that's it. And then for the hips, we'll move into something more complex, but I need to take this, the same approach, really, right? Just like, okay, how do, I, how do I simplify this form down to its bare essence and down to something that is, um, what, that is actually relevant in terms of how it manifests itself on the surface form? Well, the hips are basically like a bucket that tapers, 
proportion-wise, academic proportions would be one head high, one and a quarter heads wide, and like two thirds of a head deep. But there's this weird thing where like no anatomy book will tell you the depth of things. Very, very rarely. They just tell you the height and the width. And I think the reason for that is like everyone's just copying from everyone else, right? As, a, as an anatomy teacher, you go, okay, how did other people do it? And you, and you take that as um, you take that as, as gospel, and, and it shouldn't be. Like, the, when you're using anatomy, I think in the, in the powerful, in the most powerful way that you can, you just, you're not accepting anything, and you're just figuring it out for yourself. And the, the, one of the things that I would want to push on this little, uh, this bit of time that we have together is kind of figuring out how you can be the, how you can use anatomy to be, to be in control of something. Because if you're, if you're studying it the wrong way, then it's like anatomy leads you. And that's, that's no good. You know, you can't be a slave to your reference. You can't be a slave to the model. You need to be in charge of that and dictating how, the, how this game plays out. So with the hips, I, you know, this, I would need to push this more than this, right? So what I'm looking for is the iliac crest, right? This, this is the, the iliac bone through here. Um, most of this is covered by muscle. This becomes really important because that's a bony landmark. Uh, back here, we'd have another bony landmark back there. That becomes really important. This is more or less a bony landmark. So those are the things that I'm interested in and the main movement of the pelvis with it being rotated. And that's, that's about it. You know, I could look at this, the acetabulum, um, to find where the femur articulates. And I could look at, I could look at planes if I wanted to. Um, like, it, it, like, I don't really tend to think in terms of planes, but, uh, you know, everyone will have their different approach. If, if that's something that works for you, you can, you can find a plane break pretty much at the middle of those hips, which is also where the hips rise up and then they come down towards the middle and surround the sacrum. But anyway, these are, these are specifics and, and um, yeah, I, I don't really want to go into specifics too much in this time that we have together. So let's just say that, that we're happy with something like that as our, as our hips and then making that work with our rib cage, which will mean rotating it and then getting that scale correct, probably something like, something like that. Of course, the, the, the relationship between the ribs and the hip, the, the rib cage and the hips will be different on male to female. Um, on a male, the width of those is going to be pretty much the same. On a female, the rib cage is going to be narrower, the hips will be wider. Um, we might have time to look at that in a bit, but really like this, this is enough to create super complex form off. So it's, 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 all, that I'm, it's all that I'm interested in for now. Um, as we go to the shoulder girdle, uh, can someone tell me why we have a shoulder girdle to start with? Like, I mean, could could we function if if we didn't have one and the and the arm was just bolted onto the body? Isn't it like a, a counterbalance to the arms? I, I, I don't know if counterbalance is. Um, I don't know if counterbalance is the word that I would use. It, it's, I mean, it's, it's kind of simpler than that. It's just, it's a mobile platform for, for muscle, right? And it gives us an extra, an extra range of motion. So if I stop working on this and stand up for a minute. Um, so basically like, this is, this is the movement of my humerus, my arm bow, right? That's my scapulas. So it's given me that extra range of motion. And it's given me that in several directions. Um, you think of like, a, think of a horse, the rib cage is gonna be really flat, the scapula is going to be on the side, that scapula is going to have a huge range of motion coming forwards and backwards because it allows them to throw that leg forward before coming backwards. But the horse won't have a, a clavicle, neither will nearly all quadrupeds. Some of them have a little vestigial bone. Why is that? You need to hold on to things, right? Right, so, so clavicle is a clavicle is support for this motion. So you look at a bird, anything that needs to flap, you look at a bat, um, completely different evolutionary path to a bird, but has also developed clavicles. We have it, primates have it, for when you take the arms away from the body. I don't know what happens when you do that on a... That, that's me in my mind doing it on a dog. I, I don't know what would happen there, but I imagine they wouldn't be too happy about that. You know, the, the structure is not made for that. If you want to move the arms away from the body, you need, you need a clavicle. Um, this is a, not a super important detail by itself, but you know, within this time, what I want to be doing is reinforcing certain ideas and like you know we can open up a book and be told about a clavicle and then we can memorize the shape and the important rhythms of it and stuff but you want to be in control of it and you want to be driving you need to know why that thing exists 
and why someone wouldn't have one. You know, and that that um, it's it's like the difference, I guess, between uh, uh, I guess it's the difference between following the recipe and cooking, right? Or, or being a chef. That's that's kind of what I'm trying to get at. Like, you can follow a recipe and it'll be pretty delicious uh, if you can follow it well enough and if the recipe is good. So that's the natural tendency we have towards approaching anatomy. But my take is like, if we're if we want to be in control of it and we want to access the power of it and we want to do things to the highest level we can, you need to be a chef. You need to know what the ingredients are and how to mix that. And when you're in control of that, you can do crazy things. And that's, you know, and oftentimes we're asked to do that. So, um, so I think it's a valuable way of thinking about things. So here I'm just going to put in something really basic for the, um, the, the, the clavicle and the scapula. Something like that should be fine. And then, as always, I'm just going, well, what, what matters? You know, what is the one thing or two things or three things that matter here? On the, on the scapula, well, I, we could say my proportions. Proportions of the scapula will be about half the height of the rib cage. Um, and outside of that, I'm only interested in two lines. Right, this line through here, the spine of the scapula, which is a bony landmark. And this line through here, the medial border, which, which isn't a bony landmark. Um, but it's, it's pretty prominent. Um, just, just to clarify, we're all on the same page. What, what am I talking about if I talk about a bony landmark? It's the spine of the scapula the same. So what happens, like, if this skeleton guy was going to the gym every day, uh, his trapezius muscles, well, the muscles around here are all going to get developed and, and this landscape is going to become mountainous, right, as the muscles start to bulge out. And that spine of the scapula will stay exactly where it is, so it'll be a depression. And we see this on, on big people, or we see it when the muscle is, is compressed and under tension. Um, whereas on a skinny person, the muscle isn't going to bulge, it's going to be pretty flat, and this is going to stick out. The position of the bone is exactly the same, but um, but it manifests itself in different ways depending on what the muscle is doing. So, super important to, to get your head around bony landmarks and, you know, they help you um, place the skeleton within the figure. But also, for some reason that I don't know why, uh, we tend to not store fat over bony landmarks either. So it becomes very useful, like, you know, when you're dealing with big... Uh, well, we'll hopefully have time to look at a bit of fat later on, but it's kind of like when you're dealing with fat, you want to go Okay, well, fat, that's fine, that's, that's round and blobby or whatever. To get it to read, you need to find the opposite. You need to find the hardness of the bone. And luckily, um, these bony landmarks are generally a place for us to do it on fatty people or fatty creatures. So, when we're looking at a scapula, this is all bony landmark. This isn't, but it does show itself on the surface. It's very easy to find that on the surface. So that, that's the difference. This portion through here is covered a little bit by muscle. The trapezius covers that but this isn't. So if you, if you have a really developed trapezius, that will start to disappear, but this never will. If you follow this round through, you will find this relationship that the scapula has with the clavicle. So this is coming around here, and it's kind of like hugging the clavicle in place. So this is where the clavicle is finishing. And then this is what the scapula is doing. So this is the what's called the chromium process. It's just it's just an extension of that line. Comes around, hugs the clavicle. So there is there is contact through here. Um, you you can find this in yourself really easily. Right? You can find your, your the whole of your clavicle is a bony landmark. So you can find that really easily. And then what you have is there's the end of my clavicle. There's a drop down there to the chromium. So there is that look, and it flattens off through there. Drop down goes flat. Um, you'll see that in life all the time because these are bony landmarks. So you have you have a guy who's really hench. Doesn't matter. That that bone is still going to stay there. It's still going to stick out. So, um, and that's uh, that's the point where, in terms of the shoulder girdle, the back meets the front through here. Uh, the the clavicle itself. We don't need to overthink this too much. Um, it basically has has an S curve like this to it. Um, one mantra that is pretty useful in in anatomy is um, form follows function. And, it, and it's kind of important because we want to be thinking about the function all the time if we want to be in control of stuff. So um, the clavicle has a noticeable form, right? It has that S-curve for a particular function. Any idea what, what the reason for that S-curve is? 
Yeah, it, it, it's, it's to go around the neck, right? Because if this, if this was a straight line through there, when those clavicles get pulled up or back like this, that straight line is going to cut through the external jugular vein, right? Which would, should, what, leave you unconscious in about 10 seconds and, and dead in about a minute, I guess. So, like, cheering would be uh, much more problematic. But what we have now, what we have uh, evolved is that curves around it. So, there's always a reason for everything, and it's, you know, um, I think it's really rewarding to chase these, chase these things down. And as far as blocking in the skeletal mass of, of the torso, like, that, that's really it, you know? I'm not, there's so many details through here, little bumps and, and you know, lumps and bumps that are all there for a reason, right? They're all attachment points for muscle. There's, there's a lot more stuff that we can look at on here, but who cares? Because the muscle sits on that, so we'll, we'll never ever see it. Like studying this point, this is the glenoid cavity, the um, natural point of articulation that the skeleton has with, or that the humerus has with the scapula. Yeah, kind of important if you're, if you're looking at the, where the arm is rotating, but really, this, this is, this is going to get you as far as you need to go, as far as I'm concerned. So, we'll throw in, uh, we'll throw in a spine. And with the spine, I just want to talk about the rhythm of it. Because this is a very, very human rhythm. And again, like, it's here for a reason. We, we might have time to touch upon like, the similar movement in a quadruped. But this, this movement that we have as humans, like this, the spine coming back through here, right, comes back through here, and then pushes forward again, is a very human movement. What's happening, like I mentioned before, this is coming underneath to the middle of the head to support the weight of the head. Then it gets pushed back by the rib cage. Then it comes forward again to support the weight of the rib cage. Then it comes back. And then it even comes forward down here. The sacrum has that final little bit of curvature to it. So, um, so finding, finding this rhythm, like uh, super, super important, generally speaking, I would say, because there's an idea that I think about a lot and I talk about a lot when I'm teaching, which is like coming back to this idea of looking at things through the lens of story, right? When you boil down story to its bare essence, you're generally left with two juxtaposing ideas. In a film, a guy wants something, something stops him getting it. Um, in, in, uh, in drawing, it might be light against dark, something like that, you know? Um, you take it down far enough and basically you end up with uh, order versus chaos is, is, is that balance that we see in nature. And very, very significant for us if we're trying to make something feel natural because you will have a tendency, probably, I have a tendency to, to move towards uh, order because order is safe, right? Chaos is more representative of nature. That's where you're gonna get your face ripped off by a lion. So we will naturally tend towards when we draw, when we sculpt, when we work with the figure, safer, safer forms. Um, that means that we tend to make things geometric. So like 90% of the time, the error that we would make with this body is just to make the back a straight line up and down or the front a straight line up and down. So looking to see where that breaks is um, it's very important. We'll, lo we'll look at that in the muscles in, in more detail, but it's a, uh, it's a kind of recurring idea. There's like, I would say, I don't know, in my experience, it's probably like one in 40, one in 50 people maybe have a natural tendency towards chaos. Um, that's kind of terrifying, but you can see it in their work. You know, they're, they're the people who would do just naturally like amazing work. And there would be a nightmare to work with an environment like this because the topology would be, best, would be a mess. The naming convention would be called like bum bum three for like a hundred different files or whatever, you know, but there's that raw potential. Uh, unfortunately for most of us, it's the opposite, right? We will tend towards order. So we need to find any opportunity that we can to break that. Um, so with the spine, that S curve, boom, no other animal has that. Like you'll see a gorilla, like, you know, sometimes they like to stand upright, but they're not evolved to do that. So they don't have that same supportive, supportive rhythm, supportive structure. Um, okay, let's, um, let's just block this out with some basic forms because we're going to turn it into, uh, we're going to turn it into a full figure. So um, something for the middle, I, I, this isn't going to be anatomical. I'm just going to have a, like what, like a filler mesh, something like that. Okay, that's just going to give me a basis to work from. And then I'm going to put in something for the neck. And my, my thought when I'm working with the neck is like that it's a cylinder that just leans forwards. Something like that. 
I mean, and we've already seen that with the with the clavicle. You can see that with the uh, and the opening of the rib cage there. It's all spherical, so that would be my my jumping off point there. But when I'm when I'm working with this, what I have straight away is parallel lines, right? I I've I've all, and of course all primitives will give you this. All primitives will give you unnatural constructs. So that's just something to be aware of, right? Like from a design point of view, as soon as I have that, I want to smash it because you won't see it in nature. And that's, that's a question that you want to ask when you're using your reference is like, okay, what can you give me that's going to give me that variety, give me that break? When you look at it in the neck, it's something like this. The, the front, well, here, obviously, we have the trachea, but the big break is, is just back here. So you have, you have one line there fighting against two lines, something like that. This is more vertical. So straight away, that's, that's at least broken me out of my my parallel lines, which is just going to kill me, which are going to stop me making anything that feels natural or organic. Um, okay, let's let's look at um, well, let's let's look at putting in some muscle mass. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about what my thought process is when I'm working with muscle. So 